Welcome to the Parenting with Impact podcast with your hosts, Elaine Taylor-Klaus and Diane Dempster, co-creators of ImpactParents.com, an online community, award-winning blog, and service organization, helping parents all over the world to raise complex kids become capable, independent adults. Hi, everyone. Elaine and Diane here. And we know that you want your complex kids to grow up to be happy and independent. And yet you're not always sure how or when to help with that. In this podcast, we'll encourage you to collaborate with all kinds of complex kids and support them in navigating life and learning. And we'll interview leading experts from around the world, as well as parents in our own community, talking about how training for parents actually helps these complex kids. We'll talk about the issues we hear parents struggling with all the time and how a coach approach can support and empower your amazing young people. We won't tell you what to do. We're going to help you figure out how. So let's move on to the next conversation. Welcome back, everybody, to another conversation in the Parenting with Impact podcast. Diane and Elaine here. And sometimes we like to bring you hot topics. And sometimes it's the issues that are coming up in our coaching. We look for the themes and see what feels like it is resonant. And Diane's got a great topic for us for this week. Well, I guess the backstory in this is how many times as parents, it's like, but we got to do this, but this has to happen, but that has to happen. It's a sort of We get this sense of urgency. This came up a lot at the end of school season where it's like, okay, I get that my kid's having a hard time. I get that my kid has executive function challenges, but there are 14 missing assignments and they have to be in by Saturday night. What do I, you know, it's like this sort of, there's this sense of urgency that creates and actually shifts us energetically out of what I would call creative problem solving, which is what we want to be in all the time when we're working with our kids and their challenges is, okay, my kid's having a hard time turning in their assignments. My kid's having a hard time getting up to get out the door to their job and they're going to lose their job if they don't get out the door. This I had another client whose kid is taking an online class this summer and the kid was sleeping in and not going to school. And it's like this sort of, but they have to pay that they have to pass this class because the classes I've made an investment. And if they don't pass, they're going to, it's this sort of, you can just feel the energy that happens. And I don't know if you see this in your groups, but I'll, I'll catch a parent and they'll be like, but it's like this, or you can just feel the escalation of urgency in their tone, in their body. And, and it happens to all of us because it, sometimes it feels like there's either a time crunch or a, there is a sense of urgency or something like that. And it makes it hard for us to be really as clever and creative as we need to be able to help our kids effectively. Yeah. Well, what's coming up for me as you're saying this is what you're describing is an attachment, right? It's Mm -hmm. a deep attachment to the outcome. It's a focus on the task rather than the relationship and an attachment to the outcome of how something has to be. Right. And when our kids are little, we need to be attached to the outcome because we want to help that there are things that they need to learn. Right. But as they start getting older, if we're so attached to the outcome, we're actually preventing them, robbing them of the opportunity to learn through their own approach and method and process. Right. And yeah, I, I like that you, you added that because the, that sense of urgency, they've got to learn this. That's how common is that? It's like this sort of, oh my gosh, they're getting older. They haven't learned this yet. They've got to learn this. Right. And but- But if we're attached to the outcome and we're holding the agenda, they're not learning anything. Yeah. Right. It's not. This is why we talk about agenda so much, because if they're if we can help a kid, we can wake them up and get them out the door. But if he's not the one or she's not the one saying, I want to be able to wake up and get out the door. We're just dragging them to their success instead of enrolling them in it. Well, and so I think that what we're talking about is the short term versus the long term, right? And it's just listening to everybody say, yeah, but to what you just said, because yeah, but they still have to go to school. And so if I can't get them out the door in the morning, like, what do I do in the meantime? And that's really what I want to invite us to is this is a process, helping them figure out how to get out the door in the morning, helping them to get buy-in for getting out the door in the morning is not something that happens overnight. And if we're attached to the outcome and freaking out that they're not going to make it to school today, we're going to be in a less, we're going to actually, honestly, we're going to be the animal part of our brain going fight or flight. I got to fix this. This has to change right now. How do we get this done? 
Right. Well, it's that difference between ownership and scaffolding, right? Like when we're working with parents, in the, when I think about coaching groups for the parents of teens, the parents of young adults, right? It's always about what are we working on next? What are they working on next? And there are going to be times where you're going to scaffold and getting them out the door because they're so busy worried about getting their homework done. And that's what they're taking aim on and focusing on right now. And so it may make sense to scaffold them to get them out the door. If what they're taking aim on is getting out the door, then it's got a different kind of approach and accountability. So there's something here about knowing when we're in scaffold mode or support mode, right? And they're working on something else or when we're supporting them in their ownership of something. You're and working. both of those are problem solving modes, right? And so go back to what the, the initial right. thing is, once you are in problem solving mode, you can figure out, am I going to scaffold this? Am I teaching the skill? What's my next baby step? What's my next, you know, how do I move the situation forward instead of, oh my gosh, I got to fix this and I got to fix this now. And so I think that's the call here is how do you begin to notice when you're in, oh my gosh, this has to change. I have to change this. I'm the only one that can do this. They're never going to do this. All that, like I have a teacher who calls it disaster mind, right? We call it catastrophizing. So when you notice that disaster mind or that catastrophizing shows up, or you notice that your body starts to get more anxious, it's like, oh my gosh, like I, I can just feel myself sitting up and tightening my neck and like all those things that happen when we get into that sense of urgency, it, I, I want to tell you, you don't have access to your full capacity as a human. If you're in that space, all you're going to do is like fight or flight in that moment. Right. So I'm smiling as I'm hearing you say it, because I was, when I was doing a podcast episode with Rosalind Wiseman, who is the who does a lot of work on empowerment. She's, she works with students empowerment. She's the one who wrote Mean Girls, mm -hmm. and Babies and Wannabes. And, and she was talking about the kind of how important it is for we parents to get ourselves out of the way and to manage our own anxiety, which we talk about all the time. Yeah. And the two examples she used, one was catastrophizing and the other, and I love this term, is what she said, when we adults are having a self-righteous temper tantrum. <laughs> Isn't that great? So yeah. part of what we're talking about is the, and the self-righteous temper tantrum is the, is the piece of it because that's the yeah, but that's justifying our reactive behavior because well, and and then he was giving an example when you go into the schools and you're going to school them or teach them or whatever, but it doesn't really matter what the scenario is. If you're so sure you're right. You're well, but there's a chicken and an egg thing that goes on here because what you're describing is a dysregulated response, whether yeah. I'm going in in self-righteous mode or I'm going in in oh, the sky is falling mode, right? Either of those, I have to go back and go, wait a second, there's some fear or emotion or overwhelm or there's some something that's underneath that self-righteous reaction because self-righteous behavior is a fight or flight-ish response. Exactly. No, yeah. that's exactly, that's what, it, I mean, she was all, the whole thing was about, we have to get ourselves out of the way. And those were the two key examples she used to show how we tend to step in the way. Yeah. And so when you apply that to what we're talking about here, right, which is we can't problem solve if we're in a reactive place. And yet we when we are feeling reactive, we feel like we have to solve the problem. It's the quintessential paradox. Yes. Okay. So let's take a break and come back and tell people what to do about it. <laughs> Hi, it's Elaine. And if you like this podcast, you'll love our coach approach. Whether you're a parent looking for support or a professional supporting families, we invite you to download a free guide with 12 key coaching tools at impactparents.com slash gift. You can begin using a coach approach to help kids become more independent or improve all of your conversations at work and at home. That's impactparents.com slash gift. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. The, this is the Parenting with Impact podcast, and we are talking about this paradox we just identified. The I love what you said. It. Can you say it again? Quintessential parenting paradox is that we can't problem solve when we are urgently needing to solve a problem. And yet when we're urgently needing to solve a problem, 
Well, I don't know how I said you it. Said when you said you can't solve a problem when you're in reactive mode, but when you're in reactive mode, you feel like you have to solve the problem. That's it. Yes. Yeah. You're, you're, there's an urgency to solve the problem, right? And so just that truth and knowing that, right? It's just, we always teach commit to calm. This is what committing to calm means. It doesn't mean you're calm all the time, but it means, okay, wait, maybe I'm not my best self when I'm feeling this sense of urgency, this sense of reactivity, this sense of, right? So- Well, it's that notion of being responsive versus reactive, mm -hmm. right? That's really what we're talking about is that when we are in a reaction mode, we're not gonna be problem solving from our highest best self or brain. We have to slow ourselves down, reclaim the brain in order to be able to respond thoughtfully. Is that fair? Right, right. And so that's the first step, right? So we go back to the trigger model. We talk, I don't know what episode that is, but let's connect back to the episode on the trigger model. But part of it is just even noticing, whoa, wait a second, I'm in hypervigilance. I'm in reactivity. I'm in, got to make this happen, whatever it is for you, right? We all have different flavors of it. Hopefully you all are getting a feel for what it's like in your brain and your body. Take a minute and think about it if you haven't. But it's noticing when you're there and going, okay, wait, is this a time to react or is this a time to respond? If you can create that space. And if you can't create that space to like stop what you're doing, it's like when your kid is having a meltdown, you stop what you're doing, you calm yourself down. And then you say, is this time to, to respond? And you focus on the meltdown instead of whatever the yes, other exactly, is. Exactly. Exactly. So it's the meltdown in your head, right? It's just, if you can calm yourself down, great. If you can't, then focus on calming down rather than focus on responding versus reacting. So what just came up, Diane, is I was coaching a, a client of mine, not around parenting, around business issues. And he was talking about this issue. And we were looking at how do you pause and take the beat before being reactive, right? Yeah. So that you're not reactive, so that you're able to respond to the dynamic. And the irony is that we were actually using the example of how has he learned to do that as a parent with a child on the autism spectrum to be able to apply that to his work in the business realm as a leader in a business environment, right? But the, the exercise was the same, was what are the things that we can do to slow ourselves down, to take the beat, to remind ourselves to pause before we. The before tool we that I love to teach is if you do it all the time, you'll do it when you need it. Yeah. That's why I taught pregnancy yoga. Right. It's just, if I always, so the way I teach the tool is but when somebody asks you anything or before you take any action or say anything, you take a deep breath. Right. So somebody says, hey, mom, what's for dinner? <sighs> We're having spaghetti. Hey, mom, where's my backpack? Where right. is this at last? <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy, but that's one tool. Like it's just sort of and again, it's part of this is awareness and slowing yourself down enough. And when you get anxious, when you get frustrated, when you get overwhelmed, your brain literally speeds up. And so it makes it hard. And so it's sometimes it's just consciously going, how do I spend today at a lower level of revolutions and notice when I'm spun up? I mean, that's what I have to do is, okay, how do I stay? Whoop, I'm starting to spin up. How do I stay back down again? So what, what's striking me, and I don't know if we've ever done a podcast episode about pause, but when you, when we started coaching, I know it was one of the first probably parent tips we ever did. But what a foundational piece to coaching. We're all about bringing coaching skills to parents, right? And I don't know how much we talk about this. A foundational piece of coaching is, is to notice the pause, to, to honor the pause, to create pause, mm -hmm. right? It's about pausing to allow for reflection, for awareness. I, I was teaching a class yesterday and I was coaching. Group? Of, what's that? Like a group of coaches? No, it was, I was teaching a group of people who were becoming coaches and I was coaching in front of them. And there was one point the person got really emotional and I just waited, right? You know how we do. It's like, you just wait and you just wait. And, the, and the, somebody types in the chat, how long do you wait before you say something? And it, it's this sort of, <laughs> that's the discipline. It's this sort that of- is a piece of strength. You wait, in this instance, you wait until you notice the body shift. 
right? In this instance, I, I that's what I said. I watched her body shift. So yeah. I knew that she was like in a place where she could hear the next question. It's the same sort of thing for you. It's like, how long do you wait? How long is the pause? You wait until your body shifts so you go, okay, wait, I'm not revved up. I'm uh, relaxed enough to yeah. choose to respond versus react. But you have to do that from a place of, awareness it's you've got the one of the hardest things about coaching and parenting is staying with things that are hard mm-hmm. right is being with other people's discomfort being with our own discomfort i was coaching another client the other day who has much younger children and it was about you're not going to keep teach this kid s- emotional self regulation if you are rescuing them because it's too uncomfortable for you when they're upset. Well, and that's that the uncomfortable for you is probably a reactive response, right? I can't handle this a client I had yesterday was fighting in her head over her young adult success in a class. This kid has to succeed in this class. They have to pass. They have to do this with, okay, maybe part of what they need to do is struggle with this a little bit. Right. Right. And trying to figure out how do I balance those two? And how do I decide when to do what? And the bottom line and what we've been talking about is we are always deciding when to do what. And your ability to decide when to do what is completely different if you've calmed yourself down than if you notice that yourself is revved up. And it's not always really revved up. Sometimes it's just agitated. Sometimes it's like we teach what aware, alert and alarm. Right. And we all know when we're yelling at our kids or we're shut down or we're over the deep end, mostly it's that in between state where it's kind of like, wow, I'm not in my, I always say I'm not in my right mind right now, but I don't quite know that I can't hold it together. That so many of us end up in fake calm in that moment. Right. Yeah. And so do our kids. Right. I, I was thinking about this time when my son was about eight or nine and I was doing the, we're going to just take some time and calm down and, and wait. We're not going to talk about this yet. And he was like, okay, I'm ready to talk about it. Actually, I know you think you're ready to talk about it, but we're going to wait and we're going to do this. And to hold, he was so angry, but it was so clear to me that the that my primary thing to do was to not let him move into problem solving from this triggered place but to help him move out of fake calm and into real calm. And that actually took probably 20 minutes. It wasn't two minutes, which is what he wanted it to be. Yeah. And the voice in our head is going to say, I don't have time to get calm. Right. And (laughs) I've got to do this. We've got to fix this. And so this is about managing ourselves so that we can create the space for them to be able to learn to manage themselves. Yeah. I love that. So we need to start wrapping this up. How do you want to, how do you want to, No, I think it's just the reminder, our intention is always to respond versus react. We get that. And I'm going back to the comment you made earlier, which is the sort of when you're in reaction mode, you don't know you're in reaction mode because you're trying to fix it. And then you, but you need to be able to, you want to solve the problem. You feel like you have to solve the problem. We get stuck in that loop. And so there has to be this conscious effort to go, okay, how do I self-manage? Because I'm not going to be able to self-manage when I need to self-manage. I don't know how else to say that. Yeah. And that goes back to the term that we used earlier, I think is so true is this is like the, maybe it's not the parent paradox. Maybe it's the human paradox. Oh, it is. Right. Is that I can't solve a problem when I'm reactive, but when I'm reactive, I want to solve the problem. I feel like I have to solve, I have to solve the problem. And that's the piece of self-awareness that we can really actually begin to address and do something about. Yeah. We can even teach our kids about that, which is a whole other podcast episode. Right. <laughs> Or maybe it's this one. All right. Anything else before we? No. Thanks for the conversation. I love this. Links in the show notes, everybody. I'll put the trigger journal in there and a couple of podcast links and check it out. Anything else? No. Thanks for listening. Thanks for, as always, for what you're doing for yourself and for your kids. At the end of the day, you make the difference. Huge difference. Take care, everybody. You've been listening to the Parenting with Impact podcast with Elaine and Diane. For more information on the Impact Parents community or to join Sanity School for Parents, please visit impactparents.com. If you like what you've heard, please share this podcast with friends who need similar guidance and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. 
For the essentials of Elaine and Diane's coach approach to parenting, download a free tip sheet at impactparents.com slash podcast. Behavior therapy training for parents is actually recommended as a first-line treatment for complex kids. For information about Sanity School, our training program for parents or teachers, which has helped thousands of families around the globe, visit impactparents.com slash sanity school.